I'm thinking about metaphor, and it's particularly prompted by this series of kind of dialogues and video exchanges between Professor Anton and his colleague and uh, P. Mathematica, and also to be serious. Um, the, well, it really gets to the heart of something that I kind of worry the bone about a bit in my own thinking, which is to do with the role of, uh, well, metaphor specifically, but figurative thinking more generally in uh, in science and in empirical knowledge processes more generally. Because there does seem to be, well, there's quite a lot of evidence to su not to suggest that metaphor uh, and figurative um, language and figurative thinking indeed does operate within science and by that I don't just mean that it operates at the level of how we talk about science because of course of course that's going to be the case um, there's a really nice book by Roger Jones I think it is called Physics and Metaphor or Metaphors and Physics or something like that where he talks about this quite extensively um, yeah of course when we use terms like black hole and quark and singularity and those kind of things. Of course, we usually were talking metaphorically, but those are, that's not what I mean, really. That's, those are just, um, well, those are placeholders for the unknown. I think, Steve, I think Richard Dawkins talks about that, that those are just terms that you use um, prior to, either prior to a more considered uh, scientific inquiry into a particular phenomenon, or as just a, a casual way of speaking about that, or, or, or occasionally as a way of of describing in natural language uh, what really can only be described in in very unnatural languages like mathematics. And by unnatural language, I mean language which doesn't um, describe the phenomenal world of the senses, but perhaps describes some other world or some other combination of worlds or the possible who knows anyway something like that. So metaphor exists, of course, within natural language and how science occupies natural language. But I think there's also some suggestions that it, that it operates, uh, at, well, even at the level of mathematics. And here I'm looking at uh, Lakoff and Nunez's work on where mathematics comes from and, and, and other work that Rafael Nunez particularly has done on uh, mathematics as, well, just as, as metaphorical processes. I'm not so steeped in that work that I'm able to articulate it very clearly, I don't think, so I wouldn't really want to try to get there. But the, the, the suggestion is that, that even the most, um, the most rational and the most uh, delightfully inhuman processes and the most unnatural processes of mathematics are, are also using figurative language, or fig not, not so much figurative language, but figurative but use figuration in their conceptualization. Um, but the bottom line is for me there is that, so it's not really, well, there's two things, there's two problems I have with it, or two difficulties I have with it. One is the difficulty to do with um, a relationship between metaphorical and literal. Is that a, is that a useful distinction to make? Um, personally, I don't think it is, because I think it seems to me that the closer you look at scientific inquiry, the then terms like literal doesn't really make any sense, you know. If um, if I know that this wall is not really made of solid material, it's made of, um, well, largely of space. What does that make, what does that literally mean? Does that mean, clearly it isn't made literally of space because if you if you start inquiring into the nature of space, a different kind of literalism kicks in, um, and words like literal stop making any sense. Literal is a is a human scale thing in and of itself. So as soon as you start actually inquiring into the nature of the universe around us, the distinction between literal and metaphoric I just think isn't terribly useful. It's more, it's, I think it's more useful to make a distinction between uh, kind of robust descriptions of the world as opposed to weaker descriptions. Um, and, and metaphor is a, is a, and all kind of figurative speech is a, a means of describing. So that's that's one of the difficulties I have is that distinction between metaphorical and literal, whether that's right or not. The second thing is to do with, um, I guess, like truth conditions, really. Because what, what's, what's, what uh, scientific inquiry does, at its best at least, is it produces a series of predictions, and those predictions can be evaluated according to certain evidence-gathering processes. 
um, and they attest to a certain truth condition. So, the, so the, you know, quantum physics is the best example, isn't it? The, that the predictions that quantum physics makes, even though they're incomprehensible in, in, in a kind of literal sense, in a kind of um, in terms of human understanding of what those equations represent, the predictive power of those equations is enormous. So in some sense, as Dawkins says, these things must be true. So they make truth claims about the world and they're predictive truth claims. So to the extent they are metaphors or figurations, they're figurations with a very particular power, and that is the power to predict. Whereas most metaphors outside of science don't even, well, they don't have that function really. Their function is purely descriptive or is, is, um, uh, is theoretical in the sense that they provide frameworks of understanding but not frameworks of prediction and control. So that's the, the second thing I have with this science as a metaphor um, issue really. And I suppose the third thing is just, it's just I guess the relationship of neurology to all this and the, and the relationship of, of, of embodiment and the relationship what a brain is. Because of course all this time we're talking about the natural world we're talking about it from the position of entities within that natural world. So all of the claims that we're making about the natural world are made using these systems that we ourselves occupy. So it is always a little bit like an eye trying to look at itself or an eye not, not able to see the, the mechanisms of its own. Oh, I don't know. I don't know if I can make any sense with that. But either way, there seems to be something quite, um, uh, quite bootstrapped about those processes. You know, the instrument that's measuring the world is made of the stuff of the world. So inevitably that's going to be, I'm not sure if constraint is the right word, but it's going to provide a different, it's going to provide a very particular map of the territory that it's examining. And, 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 and given that we are our own instrumentation, our cognition, our, the, the mechanisms that we produce, including the mechanisms of mathematics and the mechanisms of science, are, um, I, I, I'm, I'm guessing the kind of our mechanisms. I know they appear transcendent, and 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 mathematics just particularly does seem to occupy a space that's outside of human knowing. It seems to offer a set of transcendent truths. Um, does it make sense to say two plus two equals four when there's no ear to hear that sum being? Uh, being added up, but I'm, I'm not sure about that. It certainly does make, yeah, I don't know. I, don't know. I mean, that, that's the that's the the conundrum that I keep finding myself in. I don't know if I made any sense there or not.